Hi everyone, welcome to the fourth episode of Unpacking Reactivity. My name's Dave. I'm Buddy. Today we're going to give you a strategy and a practical approach to implement the first section of how you're going to start working on this, which is the engagement work that we want you to do. So in a nutshell, engagement really is about creating handler value and reducing the value that the dog perceives in the environment. So, so a lot of people confuse engagement with focus. Focus is something we can train very quickly, teaching essentially a dog to look at us. That doesn't mean the dog doesn't want to still go chase the ducks. Engagement is a dog that doesn't care about the ducks and a dog that actively wants to work with the handler. So we really want to focus on this as a standalone exercise to really increase the handler's value. And for some people, you'll find just by doing this alone, you're going to greatly improve the way your dog responds when you're out and about. It's a big topic. Um, you, We can shamelessly plug uh, this coming weekend. You do a six hour workshop on this. We're yeah. gonna do 20, 25 minutes of it. So it is a big, big overarching topic, but it's most of a lot of the outlash and problems you see can almost a lot of times be brought back to this as a root cause. So um, there's a few different ways to look at it and we can start looking at play, why, why play is so important and how that's even relevant in what we're doing here. Secret word? Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Um, secret word today is togs. So for the Americans out there, what are togs? Uh, they are bathers. Is, Bo- does that make sense? <laughs> Board shorts, yeah, yeah. <laughs> your swimsuits. We, go we, get your togs. we swim in our togs. You just swim in your togs. So if you could, when we uh, drop that word, Put a um, timestamp in your social media, whatever platform you're using. First responder, put the timestamp in and we'll send you two beefy balls. We'll get in touch. And um, yeah, it's a good little prize for your engagement. And uh, yeah, only just to notify, just to be clear as well, because we had a bunch of people sort of going in after the the last winner. So just the first one who notifies that timestamp or lists that timestamp gets the, uh, the prize on that. All right, let's dive into engagement. The play. The play. All right, so probably a couple of things we want to just touch on, and we've already spoken about this a little bit uh, throughout the other episodes, so we don't want to get too deep into the theory. We want to move pretty quickly into the prac. But but realistically, <clears throat> as a result of how many dogs are developed in terms of either puppy school, a lot of excessive social, socialization with other dogs, or a dog being allowed to express things like its prey drive in chasing birds and other things, and those things haven't been blocked and redirected into more productive things with the handler. We end up in this situation where the dog has a really tilted view of the, the world. We don't, we're not, when we talk about creating handler value, we're not suggesting that we don't want the dog to still enjoy the world. We absolutely mm-hmm. do those things with our dogs, but, but when we're trying to uh, shift the value back to us, we might want to quarantine the program for a little while and just do a lot of excessive stuff that really increases the handler's value when out and about. So the, the sessions we're talking about today, what you actually want to do, just to give you a bit of a framework, is you want to look in your local area, find four to five places where you're not going to get heavily harassed by other dogs, and you want to start working on though this, this session that we're talking about today. <clears throat> Those places should include your front yard, the footpath at the front of your house, a quiet park area, not a dog park, a quiet park area near your place, maybe an industrial zone near you. You can go to a shopping center, not where people are all pushing the carts and kids are running around, but on the outskirts of that area. But what we're trying to do is is teach the dog that in all of these varied areas, it's conditioning that we hold much greater value than the other thing that's happening um, in that space. So, so there's two things that we're going to look at today. Um, how you can start act- actively doing this. We're going to look at <clears throat> food and toys. Now, some of you will say, well, my dog won't play when out, out and about. And some of you might even say, well, my dog won't take food when it's out and about. <clears throat> and just to, excuse me. <clears throat> you need a fine job. Yeah. You have to pay fines for every time you clear your throat. <laughs> so, uh, and, and the reason for that is because the dog is so hyper aroused when it goes into these environments because it's got such extreme value in these environments. Mm-hmm. And, and, and what's happening is your dog is getting loaded with adrenaline. And as we know, when dogs are full of adrenaline, their appetite really suppresses. They don't want to eat. And all sorts of things are no longer effective. So 
<clears throat> what's really, really important, if that's the case for you, your dog won't play or take food, is you really work in small increments from your house. Just start in your front yard, start in your backyard, and just slowly start edging your way out into the world. Um, and we'll look at strategies um, to assist you with that as we go. But we're gonna start with food. Um, and it's not just about going out and doing food training with your dog, you can absolutely play with your food. Yeah, yeah. Um... <laughs> um, so a couple big ones with, with the food is a lot of how food gets moved um, like dynamically so we can create sort of prey drive and things like that with food the way we move it um, also the quality of food of what you're using is going to be massive isn't it so I, I think a lot of people might might um, take some I don't know there, there's some brands out there that have some very basic treats and it's cardboardy and it's not super exciting if you can get something super high quality something fleshy something um, we're big advocates of Prime 100 stuff like that, that absolutely matters and and we see it all the time in group classes where the dog goes ah oh, not, dog's not really food driven and then I get that one thing and I dog eats it looks down and then goes what the heck was that and then all of a sudden it switches on so the quality of food I think for me is a big one yeah, absolutely. So you want to look at, before you even go out into the world, if we're trying to tilt the dog's attitude back to the handler. They got to like it. <laughs> you, you really need to find out ways to to massively increase the value of food. So that's the, really the first starting point is making sure, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that the dog is hungry. So it hasn't eaten when you first go out and about, that you're using something that's highly desirable. For, for that dog and for some dogs we go as far and I appreciate that a lot of you won't want to do this but for a lot of our dogs when we're dealing with dogs with really really high prey um, we, we all use raw we'll go out we'll get some beef mince mix a bit of kibble or something into it make it a little bit crunchy so you can make little balls up with it um, and 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 the attitude you get from your dog simply as a result of taking that next step allows you to speed up the process five to tenfold can you talk about the difference between treats and food when you hear like oh i gave my dog treats on the walk there's a difference between that and actually using a meal yes yeah so we don't really talk as a general term in terms of treats so it's really the dog's food and diet and then looking at what so firstly create a, a very nutritious healthy diet for your dog and then pull out of that things that you can use for its training so you might uh, do your food prep in the morning so that's all set and you can pull elements out of that and train your dog throughout the day and at the end of the day <clears throat> the dog can have the rest of that food in a bowl or however you want to distribute that food so that's what we're talking about we're not really talking about it's not about going out and buying treats and then using those for your dog this is also so some we've had plenty of comments over the years on our socials and some people would say well it's it's mean to make dogs work for their food well there's not a living carnivore on the planet that doesn't either scavenge or hunt for their food so it's actually more unnatural to put food in a bowl than to actually actively make them work for their food um, and heaven forbid we should actually mentally stimulate them and challenge them a little bit to um, to actually enrich their lives so uh, that's yeah. That's how I break it down. Yeah, for sure. I, I just think the big the biggest tip is if you are putting food in a bowl uh, and then going out on your walk and then trying a couple of treats on there, you're working against yourself. So I would, if that's something that you do and it is pretty common pet practice, switch that. So just take take whatever food you the dog enjoys and whatever they eat as a breakfast. Take away breakfast on the go and start using that as training. I think it's a massive first step. And, and the other part of it as well is that low quality food isn't helping your dog at all so so like we often talk in food in terms of currency so are you is the treat worth five cents or three bucks to your dog if you're delivering five cent treats to your dog that is not creating any emotional change so it's not the, it's not a fact that you you just need to do more reps it's not like oh well, the food's low value so i'll just do another five thousand reps and that will help no you'll actually make no change if anything you'll go backwards if i was asking buddy right now to do push-ups for five cents <laughs> per hit he, he 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 probably would because he's likes doing no. things like that. <laughs> twenty for a twenty for a dollar is not. It's not. That's not my ratio. It's not a good pay rate. No. So we really want to look at what is making it worth the dog's while at the start. Now, as time goes on, the dog is getting a level of association with you, the handler, 
and being out in these environments as a result of the tool that we're using, which is a high value reward. And just through that association and repetition, then the mood starts to change regardless of the food. So it's important to understand we don't end up dependent on the food forever or the toy forever, but we need to slowly wean off and we absolutely want to still reward good behavior with a form of positive reinforcement. So it's not, we don't ever get rid of food or toys. We always keep them as an option, but, but the process at the start is very reward heavy. And then we, we fade that out as we go. But if we go back to food again, as a starting point, so we're gonna talk about food on its own today, and then we'll talk about toys separately. If you're going out with food, as you mentioned before, buddy, we really wanna look at how we can make that food far more desirable. And one of the activities and really simple activities you can do with your dog when you're going out and about is just a little food chase game. So get them out of the car, you're driving them to these locations or you're walking out the front of your house. Don't stand there dead still. Get your dog to chase a piece of food and just make these sessions at the start. Sounds ridiculous, we've spoken about it in other episodes. 30 seconds to one minute, they can be that short. When you're trying to take, change emotion, it's really important that you keep those sessions really short and sharp and you finish with the dog dog wanting more. So a short, the, the reason why short session is because we don't want to go, there's a piece of kibble, 30 seconds, the dog checks out, dog checks out, another piece of kibble. And that's not the, the response we're looking for. And so Dave's talking about reward heavy. I might use marker, yes, and go pay, 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 pay as I'm moving food around, but it's very, very fast. So this is why this, if we did this for 30 minutes, obviously we'd have two kilos of food. So we're not after that. We're after your meal, boom, a very high rates of rewards. So the dog goes, whoa, really buys into it rather than just dribble feeding over a 45 minute walk. You can almost argue if you were to dribble feed over a 45 minute walk, you're at best staying neutral, you could be being counterproductive. So yeah. super quick and just pay friendly. Pay 10 bucks a push up, not five cents. Yeah. All right, so I just want to give you a simple technique on that as well. I was wondering why you brought your toys. <laughs> I have not been told why there are uh, <laughs> toys here. So this is a theoretical discussion, but obviously we want to be able to just demonstrate some prac for you as, as well. So, and, and we do have our leash aggression workshop online for purchase if you want to see all this delivered in a prac format as well. So that is available just as a side note. So we don't need rabbit yet. Is that a, yeah, that's a rabbit, is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, we just think it's a kangaroo. I don't know. Oh, yeah, maybe it's a kangaroo <laughs> rabbit. That's not a rabbit. Excuse me, that's our kangaroo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I do have some experience with wildlife, I promise. Um, so, the uh, um, all right, so if we're delivering food when we're in these scenarios, what we're doing is essentially getting the dog out for a session and we're essentially playing with their food. So, don't think of it as play with toys and play with food, you can absolutely play with food. One of the things we like to do is a food chasing game. And you don't need to worry about markers, you don't even need to talk to your dog through this process. Certainly you can encourage them, no problem. And the idea of a simple food chasing game is putting a treat in your hand, creating a little platform there for the dog to punch into, and we get the dog to chase our hands. And the idea is we do nice, sharp, 180 turns, and then let the dog access the food. Reload. Back out again, and off we go again. <clears throat> okay, now, the reason I bought the rabbit, or <laughs> kangaroo, <laughs> is because I wanted to just talk about what we're leveraging off here. We're, we're leveraging off the prey sequence. And it's really, really important to understand how that looks and how we wanna leverage off it. So a lot of you who are having this issue, your dogs are very, very prey driven. They have very high levels of prey, and they're currently getting a level of fulfillment from the environment, be that spotting a small white fluffy dog, the birds, whatever it is that might be really exaggerating that when you're out and about. That's why now, it's so common with working dogs. Just yeah. I drive more, more of it. Yeah. yeah. So one of, the, uh, so one of the, the things that we want to understand is when using food or toys is we're really trying to bring out that drive in our dogs. We actually want that to be a little prey sequence for our dogs, it's a, it's a chase and capture game that we're playing. So in order to do that, it's important to understand how it may look in a wild scenario. Now, the kangaroo or the rabbit, let's call it a rabbit. I, I feel more comfortable with it being a rabbit for some reason. Um, the, rabbit, the rabbit doesn't just squiggle around in front of 
the dog or the fox because if they did that, <clears throat> they would get taken. So, is this a weird way yeah, of doing awesome. it? Okay, cool. That's awesome. Um, um, <clears throat> now, what you tend to see though is the rabbit running hard in one direction when the dog or fox nearly gets the rabbit, there's a sharp change. And the dog's running, sharp change. Dog's running, sharp change, gets Mr. Rabbit or Mrs. Rabbit. Okay, so the key to understanding all of this though is the elements of it that's making it very rewarding for the dog. So the prey sequence is innately rewarding for the dog. It's the thrill of the chase, the anticipation of the chase brings dopamine. The thrill of the chase brings dopamine. The near misses bring dopamine. And then capturing the food or the toy also brings a level of dopamine. So you're getting this dopamine spike. That's very different to standing still with your dog and your dog looks at you and saying good and feeding. That's giving a very small amount of dopamine. So now we've taken a piece of food that might have been worth about 20, 30 cents and just through creating this Sharp, fun game, sharp movements. <clears throat> it's now worth three to four bucks to your dog. So you're getting heaps of bang for your buck with a single piece of food. But the reason I wanted to do this little demo is because when you're doing this chase game, it's really important you do really sharp 180 degree turns. Okay, so it's not a case of just slowly meandering around. We want to see your dog actively running, chasing, near missing. And it's your ability to really time this so the dog's nearly got the food, it thinks it's got it, aha, you missed it. The other part of it though is don't go too far. Don't do 400 misses so your dog loses all hope. There's a point in which your dog will stop chasing and then it gives up. So 30 seconds to a minute of just this is extremely fun and rewarding for your dog. So if you've never done this before, at the end of this video, get some food, go out into your yard and just actively get your dog to just chase food. Okay, the other thing you can do is throw food to a degree is little, a little bit. If your dog is very, very focused on the ground, you don't have to, I wouldn't do too much early days, but sometimes that just allows you to get a little bit of space from your dog. You can periodically throw a bit of food that way, then you call them back to you. As a general rule, even if the dog is focused on the ground, if you are doing this game really cleanly and smoothly and well, even if you're throwing food, the dog is gonna be, is just will be madly into you. Um, and the reason is, is because they know you're delivering all the fun. Can you show that just a little bit of luring, just like you were doing there with the animal, just like you were a second ago? Just lure, lure your dog, just like you were. So no, 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 just like you were on the table. This distance that Dave's showing here, this isn't just for video purposes. If he was luring his German Shepherd, that's how, that's how close it would be. So I don't want it to be a thing of like the dog, oh, come on over here, come on, come on, come on. This is too far. The whole point of this is to really entice at a distance this close because that's attainable. This is not. So that's, I think it's important to know that, that distance that you're showing there is actually very important to the part of the process. And, and just be mindful. That's a really, really good point. And just be mindful. They're just straight line misses at the start. Just learn that technique at the start. Don't do squiggly stuff. As soon as you do squiggly stuff, it's, it, it, you'll see you, your dog loses a level of prey in that. Over time, you'll be able to mix things into it to make it interesting. We even put skills into it. We'll do a couple of spins. We'll, we can do all sorts of activities with it. But at the start, just straight line, misses. Yep. So that is it in terms of food. Just start with that. Simply start with that. And the way it should look is the dog comes out of the car. If you drive into this place or if you're going out into the front yard, you do not let your dog sniff. Yep. So this process is really important to understand. The dog comes out and, and, you, and we want to also have a start and finish cue for these sessions. So... We go, let's say you're going out into your front yard. You go out into your front yard. Don't let your dog start sniffing or looking around. Immediately put a word on it. Are you ready? And then straight into the food chasing game. Then we want to have an end cue on it. When we're getting towards the end, but the dog still wants more, finished. And where do you go? Straight inside. Just cut it off. And what we really want is the dog to go, damn, that was really fun. It's ended. So these sessions need to be really, really short and sharp. We need to start, finish. It's the same as playing sport. It's, it's exactly the same. You go on, someone blows the whistle to start, blows the whistle to finish. And, we, and we're not going to be working the dog with this level of emotion and arousal for very long. We do this for generally the course of a few weeks, and then we start to 
pull it back. And what, what you'll see is, is that the dog's whole attitude and value in the environment has now shifted to the handler. And you know it's starting to change when you go out into your front yard or you go to the park or wherever you're going to work this, and rather than your dog looking to go sniff or looking externally, they're jumping up into you. And the other thing that we're always okay with is, is comprom you're always gonna compromise some behavior when you're developing other behavior or changing emotion. So if we start getting rudeness towards ourselves, well, that's much better than the dog having their desire to go chase the lady with a crying baby in the pram. So if the dog starts, you get the dog out of the car in the parking environment, your dog starts jumping up into you or like pressing you or barking at you, hooray. All of that is useful. Now, if you can't handle your dog in terms of you've got a really, really big dog, you're a bit of a smaller person or can't handle the weight of your dog, obviously do things to minimize the dog jumping on you. We're not suggesting you let your dog do things that's gonna be problematic for you, but that rudeness towards you tells you that you've actually created a very, very significant emotional shift. So that's really, that's I think that's a really important part to, to understand. There's a few layers to it, but let's just summarize again. Do you wanna just summarize how that session looks again for everyone so they know? What are they doing? What's a one minute session look like? One minute session is, and, and the funny thing is we're big component, big proponents of, even if the park is like a three minute walk, four minute walk from your house, get in the car, drive there. So then we get out of the car, switch on immediately. We go and we start with our start cue. You ready? Boom, the, the game starts. We go one minute, two minutes, three minutes max of fast pace, fast pace reward, high reward, luring, making the dog active, chase the prey throwing food, having the dog come back, play, play, play. When it's over, hey, all done, in the car, drive home, you are in and out of your house in no more than seven or eight minutes. It's a quick session. It's yeah. really quick. And that blows people's mind, especially yeah. if they're used to 45 minute walks and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. It will feel like a paradigm shift for you, but it, it works. Prep these sessions as well. So so just, you, you need to take your time and think about the session. The prep time for these sessions is gonna be about three times longer than the session itself. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's really important to just think about and, and just remember your start and finish cues. So go out, start cue, go into your session, 30 seconds, a minute, finish it. Now there's no reason, if you've driven to a place that's let's say seven minutes away from your place and, and you get your dog out, there's no reason you can't do multiple sessions. Now, but that's gonna depend on the level of interest your dog has in the game at this point in time. So you need to carefully read that. But you could get the dog out of the car, do the one minute session dog back in the car, let it chill for five, 10 minutes, get the dog back out of the car, do another session and back in. At the start, we wouldn't recommend that, but as time goes on, that's, that's fine. Through this period as well, because uh, this is always a common question, you can still take your dog to, let's say, a set place where it absolutely has freedom and mm. can go meander and wander, but just pick a place where you know there's no dog traffic. So so go to an environment or, or, or whatever the problem stimulus is for you. So you, you can still absolutely take your dog to a place, but pick a place that that is like just a place. Don't take them to seven places and do that at the moment. The seven places you're doing specific stuff relates to this. Have one place that you go to. As time goes on, none of this matters. So, so if you do all this really carefully, yeah, we always say important. slower is faster. So if you go really slow at the start and carefully change the emotion, then at some point, like a year or two down the track potentially, and obviously some of you, you're gonna be more restricted depending on the dog's behavioral history, um, you, you can then do whatever you want and break whatever rule you want. You still need to be conscious of the the, the processes that have got you there so you can lean back into them when you start seeing little problems because little things are always gonna pop up. And, and, and regardless of where we're at, just be very aware as well. We, we all have little issues every day. It's not like we don't go out and have perfect sessions every day. There's always things going on. And sometimes it's, I can see something in Raya, my, my working shepherd, that might not even be visible to anyone else. I can just feel the mood shifting or just the, the slight level of intensity mm -hmm. in the interaction changing, which means the next session I shift into, even if I haven't done just a pure engagement session with her for a while, I'll just go back and just do that for the next session. I'll just go and do something that just puts her in freaking hyperdrive for me. So, um, and it might not be a visible obvious thing, but you know your dogs and you'll start to sense it. So, so you, you don't ever get to an end point of it all being perfect, but you can certainly, for dogs that are developed carefully, um, from more, so if, if you had a young pup that you developed in this strategy from, from day dot, and we'll all do better with our next dogs, we understand that, um, then 
you should end up pending a few factors with a dog you can almost do anything with. You end up with almost complete freedom. And, and, and the level of opportunity that dog has is, is huge because you have, this, and we're going to go into the obedience components of this in the next episode, but tying it all together, you end up with a package that can really provide your dog with a huge amount of freedom knowing you're not going to have problems when you're out, out and about. Yeah, it's so important to, for, for people to understand, you know, even ours, it, it, it's like driving a car. Like, it's not just like, okay, cool, now and you just let the wheel go. Like, we've, we're always sort of steering to stay in the lane, hitting the brakes, hitting the accelerator, like all of us. So always just moving levers just to get things where we, we need them. Sometimes things are out of whack, we got to correct, but that's just the way it is. Yeah. Now, the other thing I just wanted to touch upon before we move on to toys is... The concept of, of just using some angles. Now we're going to go into this in, in episode six in, in a lot of detail. But, but if you're going to an environment and running this session at the moment and there's some stimulus in the background, we're, we're not, we don't want you to go to places where there's high value mm. stimulus. But if there is some stimulus that your dog may be interested in, let's say it is the rabbit, um, then the, the key is don't do anything directly towards the rabbit. Everything you're doing should be parallel, this way. So the problem we have with these little carnivores, as soon as they start getting a little bit of excitement and moving directly towards something, it's gonna trigger prey and potentially a level of aggression and arousal, frustration that it can't get there and the dog will blow. So you, you, you circumnavigate that by doing everything parallel. So that's really, really important to understand. Don't do anything directly towards the stimulus. If you don't believe me, Please take your dog out tomorrow and walk it straight at the thing and see what happens <laughs> versus sideways. And, and I've done countless and countless and countless workshops on this topic and helped lots and lots of clients, obviously. And the moment we always have problems is right on that angle, okay, as the dog comes around and, and squares up. That's generally when a lot of dogs will trigger, even when we sort of maybe 50% through the, the behavior mod process. So be very careful of that. Just work parallel to the thing cool let's work uh toys toys i if your dog has play drive and play drive can be built and there's a lot of things that fit into this but let's say your dog and your dog loves to play um i almost prefer that as an option do you um sort of a blanket statement i guess i don't really like blanket statements but Play, the, my point is play, play, people don't often think that play can be such a powerful tool when it comes to this. People think we play in the backyard and then we go on walks separately. And I'm going to push back and say, hey, let's make play a part of everything that you do in, in the world. I think, look, I think a lot of people are dealing with dogs that don't play at the level that we're going to have. Um, that they're going to be able to get the impact yeah. that they need. So, and I'm, so, I'm, I'm sympathetic there. I've got one, so I know, but that's why I leverage heavily off the food stuff that we've discussed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think the one of the ways I started talking about it for a lot of people as well is if you, especially for dogs that don't play, if you've got <clears throat> like don't think of like there are reasons to think of food and toys separately, but I think the better way to think about it for a lot of us who are maybe out there working or helping people work with this issue is that food and toys are on a continuum because, and if we start playing with food, like we've spoken about just before, you can, you're actually going to unlock a bit more prey drive with your dog and, and your dog will understand that you can provide that for it, which then can open up play opportunities with your dog that you didn't have before because, because, and, and sort of to, to Buddy's point, the, if we can unlock prey and then get the dog intensely into it, well, the value of that play interaction is going to be exponentially m more valuable to the dog in these scenarios. And we can leverage off that and make behavior change faster. <clears throat> but for a lot of people, if the, pl the play or playing with a toy sits below the value of food, well, food is your better option. Thank you for sure. Sure. So let's just be, yeah, if we can just define that because there's no point you going out and doing a bunch of play with your dog if the food currency is higher, especially when you're dealing with something which, which is such a major issue to you. Um, so I think that's probably the thing. But, but the sure. reason we put emphasis on play is because we know that it can supercharge this development part and process. Um, <clears throat> so so if, we start, if, we, if we look at play... Um, in a, in a simple sense, it is exactly what we just talked about with food. This whole process 
of running in straight lines and misses, that's exactly what we're doing with the toy. So it's the same thing that we wanna layer in with food, um, with toys. Now there is a little bit more technique and we've got various videos on our social media looking at specific play technique. Just realized we needed toys to be able to talk about toys. So anyway, magically, toys have appeared. All right, so when we're looking at developing play with our dogs, it's exactly the same sequence that we were talking about with food before. So basically we're looking at a process of straight lines and misses. So <clears throat> let's just talk about toys for a second though specifically. So there's two types of toys we commonly use in the business and there's variations of these, but we want toys that the dog can grip. So the benefit of the French linen material is, is that a dog can sink its teeth into there and not easily slip off. So when it's, it's important when you play with a dog they have the ability to grip the item. This is made of a durafoam material, our beefy balls, and the dogs can thoroughly grip into these, so they get a lot of satisfaction out of the game. Now, now the, the best way to describe it in a human sense is if you have toys that the dog can't easily grip, it will be like playing sport, netball or basketball with a ball covered in Vaseline. It might be <laughs> funny and fun for a couple of minutes, but before you know it, everyone's gonna get fr frustrated and probably not wanna play anymore. So it's very important we get the right toys with the right material. And the right size as well for the dog. And the right size as well. So there are thinner toys you can get for younger dogs or softer mouthed dogs as well. Um, but depending on the dog, these are quite often our go-to. The other thing that we always do as well is we have two of the same. So just we're talking about that process of straight lines misses, okay? At some point the dog is gonna take it. We might let the dog tug a bit, the dog wins. We always wanna have exactly the same toy on us to be able to encourage the dog back to us. And the dog should be on a lead as well. Now how you manage that lead, like I said, we have a bunch of play tutorials um, within our content that you can check out. Um, but you wanna then encourage the dog back to you and you don't wanna be stealing the rabbit out of the dog's mouth. You wanna encourage them to now play with the one you have. So we run a little two toy process. So the dog grabs it. Let's say Buddy grabs that. Okay, Buddy wins it. Feels good. You feel good? I feel pretty good. Yep. Okay, and now I've got this one. Buddy, Buddy, this is fun. Ah, then he gets that one. So we just play this two toy game, swapping over and over and over. Once again, we want to keep the session to about a minute when we're starting these, these um, processes and then build that a little bit over time. Exactly the same thing applies for the ball, but he comes, grabs it, tug, 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 oh, he wins it, super, aha, I've got the other one, this is fun, aha! Pretty quick. Um, Pretty good. So that, that's the process. It's a process of just being able to uh, change between those two toys. We would suggest getting a long line of about five meters on your dog, so your dog just doesn't run off with the toy, but please be very careful you don't get it wrapped up around your legs. There is a way of handling it so you can do all of this reasonably safely, but um, there are reasons why it becomes a little bit um, problematic periodically. But, but what we're trying to do really is show the dog that all of that energy it has to essentially go out and chase the environment. Look at the environment as competition. So it's, it's very offensive to me when my dog <laughs> looks out at another dog and gets all stimulated and like, oh, that looks like fun when I'm standing there with a cool toy. That's offensive to me. So I should be able to offer my dog something that is more fun than going and chasing that Maltese Shih Tzu. Oh, that's pretty important. Yeah. Um, again, this is a, like a subtopic of engagement that we can attend three day seminars on. This is big. We're just sort of skimming the surface on this, but not one, you, you mentioned tug a lot, not one part in there. Did you mention fetch or a chuck it or something like mm -hmm. that? And, and what, why is that for you? I have my reasons and I'm interested what, what yours are. Why tug is your go-to game rather than um, long fetch? The like early stages, the the important part is is that you're associated with the toy. Mm, for sure. So so the downside is 
through doing lots of throwing is you're creating an association of chasing something away from you, which is already a problem you have. So if we can get the interaction with us, it doesn't mean I won't incorporate a little bit of a, a throw with these tugs periodically, like we are talking about food before, being able to throw periodically, but it should be something that really exaggerates and just improves the fun of the game. It's not your main go-to. The main go-to should be the interaction with the handler and the dog should enjoy wrestling with you in a, in a fun capacity and no, Play doesn't create aggressive dogs. Most yeah. um, most dogs that haven't learned to play and found an outlet for play are the dogs that become essentially problematic because they feel unfulfilled and sometimes have this sort of pent up um, um, feeling about them. The problem with prey, prey can slip into anxiety very quickly. So if the dog doesn't have a level of fulfillment yeah. and, and it's not actively getting that, that dog can then become anxious it's like having a very energetic child in school and, and we're worried about the hyper arousal in this child so we decide we just want to teach the, uh, the child to be calm by sitting in a classroom yeah. all day and, and just reward the child for being calm well no the, the child probably should be playing sport and, and, and your dog is very aware that it's not out killing rabbits when you're doing this it's getting a great deal of fulfillment for it and we're using the sequence involved in that but your dog is very aware that it's not killing something it's a game to your dog it's your dog very, understands very contextual um, and and this is also the reason we want to start and finish cues is because that defines when we start and when we stop we don't want you to keep playing and trying to smash the ball once i've said finish the game's done uh, we can't give you all the nuances in this format, but like I said, we do have a lot of other content available and we will be doing other series as well on, on top of that. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I agree. I'm, if the more I can get the dog to realize that the toy is something that they do with me, um, that's why I really, really like to teach tug first possession games. Um, I'm not against fetch, but I also think some people beat it so hard that it becomes a service game where, hey, you do that thing for me and I'll go chase the ball. I want the thing to be a cooperative game. So that that's why tug for us, whether it's French linen ball, um, polyester tugs, whatever fits your dog, tug, possession games are good. Cool. All right. And then the only other factor that you need to be aware of when you're doing all of this is keep your dog on a lead and block any undesirable responses. You don't need to harshly punish your dog. You just need to not let them interact with that thing that they may be looking at in the middle of the play or, or food part. Just encourage them back to you. You can just pulse them back to you and get them straight back in the game. That's the only other element. But for food and toys, one minute sessions, start, finish cue, make sure you, you finish the game before the dog falls off the cliff, the dog still wants more, cut them off, you get a bit of frustration from that, so the next time they arrive, they're like, ugh, I want that game more and more, and as the time goes on, we'll ease off. We'll do far less, but you'll still have the right mood and attitude in the dog. We're not running around like idiots forever. We do this for a period of time. You wanna have about five environments that you're doing this in, pick five spots that you go out to, and just start smashing those sessions out. Like Buddy said before, the seven minutes, like total time to drive out somewhere, do the session, come back. It's not a time commitment. Um, and you can still go and have that one place where you go walk your dogs periodically um, and give them some free time. So we're not saying don't do that through this period. Generally, when we're emphasizing this engagement part, we want you to commit to it for about three, three to four months intensely yeah. to create the emotional change that we're after. So it's not a two, three week job, three to four months, just table all your other goals and dreams with your dogs <laughs> for the minute. Just do this. And I promise you, this will completely change the game for you forever. It completely, it's, it's like it's happened for me. Um, for anyone who's struggled periodically with with really getting high level engagement in various environments, whatever, those people who commit to this process in, in a very heavy way, they, they absolutely get results. That's it. Cool. All right, that's engagement. Next episode, we'll be looking at obedience skills. So the things that you're gonna to need to have in place to also be able to complement everything else that we're um, doing. And then the episode after that, we're gonna be looking at leash handling and how the lead can be used in a way that's going to also make significant um, difference. See you at the next one. Bye.